you all so much for coming. It's a pleasure to see so many uh, friendly faces and new faces uh, attending one of our events. I'm Linda Trapp. I'm the director of the Psychology of Peace and Violence program here at UMass. This is the first in a long series of talks that we're going to be hosting this year on the topics of nonviolent action and civil resistance. We would like to thank the Provost Office as well as our anonymous donors for their generous support of this speaker series, which made this possible. Um, I'd also like to make sure that everyone signs in, so if you've not already done so, before you leave, please just be sure to sign in your name and your department or other affiliations so that we can keep track of who has decided to come. Keep in mind also that as this is just the first of our series, there's many other talks coming up, the next one being on October 1st, so look for these posters that are all over the campus, and I'll also have this one propped up in back in case you're interested in seeing more of the talks and topics as well. But for today, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Stellan Windhagen. Uh, Dr. Windhagen is an Associate Professor of Sociology at University West in Sweden, and also a Senior Lecturer of Peace and Development Studies at the School of Global Studies at the University of Gothenburg. He leads the Resistance Studies Program at the School of Global Studies and he also serves as an academic advisor for the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, which is based in Washington, D.C. His research covers many topics in the area of nonviolence, including nonviolent action strategies and civil resistance, social movements and social change, and globalization and conflict transformation. We're delighted to have him here. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Stellan Vintagen. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'm honored to be here. Uh, it's so uh, inspiring that there are places in the world wanting to develop civil resistance and nonviolent action research. It's so incredibly necessary. As a matter of fact, my talk will be devoted to the, uh, the needs for such development. And I will give uh, my own take on the needs for that kind of development of the research by also um, illustrating somehow how I see that could be done, um, at least when it comes to the necessary theoretical and conceptual development, which is also one part which is necessary. Besides large-scale comparative studies, we are also in need of improvement when it comes to understanding what actually are we talking about when we talk about nonviolent action and civil resistance. So my talk is titled uh, The Four Dimensions of Nonviolent Action. And it's kind of a summary of um, a book that is coming out next year on SED called The Sociology of Nonviolent Action. So um, um, in that sense, you also get some idea of, of, um, of that. Um, as Linda told, I'm, I'm based in Sweden at two universities. Uh, my main work is happening at the University of Gothenburg, where we're having a research group that is dealing with uh, resistance studies, um, or as we often call it, critical resistance studies, as we are interested in critical understanding of how resistance both might uh, contribute to social change but also sometimes in reproducing new forms of domination. Uh, we study resistance when it comes to everyday resistance as well as large-scale regime changes. <clears throat> and it's part of uh, the attempt to create a global network on resistance studies um, where we have so far about 400 uh, scholars and activists interested in critical resistance studies uh, linked up to our network. So feel welcome to visit the site if you're interested in that kind of studies. The outline of my talk will be like this. Um, I'll be talking about um, my critique of the weakness of nonviolent action studies <coughs> as the <a> first point. <laughs> Secondly, I'll talk about a dilemma I see within the non-armed revolution studies. Thirdly, a fundamental challenge that exists within conflict studies. All these three I'll bring together in a such a way that I, I think that the 
proposal I'm coming with would be a help in that direction to understand better the social force of nonviolent action. So, firstly, then, about nonviolent action studies. Um, it was created, you could say, by Dean Sharp uh, and his classic work, The Politics of Nonviolent Action in 1973. That initiated an academic field of nonviolent action studies that was followed by a m m number of other people, like Adam Roberts in England, Theodor Ebert in Germany, and so on. There were other people that have been writing before Jean Sharp, um, but with Jean Sharp's work, there was a new form of approach to nonviolent action studies formulated in a very clear way that been so strong that you could say it created a kind of a paradigm. Um, for good and bad, that has been the kind of way uh, we have understood nonviolent action since then. The contribution that was done then by Jean Sharp and the people that followed after in inspiration of his work um, created the Albert Einstein Institution from 83 and onwards. Uh, they created something called the technique approach. Um, and today that is very much carried out by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict to which I also belong. And Hardy that is sitting here. Um, <clears throat> This development of the technique approach, um, which I will explain a little bit more um, later on, it's, 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 uh, it was a reaction to, you could say, the uh, emphasis on morality, religious principles, and ethical approach to nonviolent action that was previously uh, dominating, where people were emphasizing the uh, goodness of this kind of way of approaching in conflicts and, and waging struggles. Um, and the technique approach instead understood the struggle within nonviolent action and conflicts to be a matter of a political power strategy. So with that, there was an highlighting, or as I also would like to take it, a reduction of nonviolent action to a, an alternative, more effective weapon that could be used in political <coughs> power strategy. And with this is the approach, you know, that by applying, for example, large scale strikes, non cooperation on massive scale, civil disobedience, and so on as shown by Gandhi and also Martin Luther King, uh, Sharp was emphasizing that this was a matter of trying to address power relations and weaken the access to power for certain regimes. And by doing that, these regimes were forced to either go into negotiations compromises, or they would fall down. So this devotion to understanding how nonviolent action on a massive scale actually could address, you could say in a realist understanding, could address power and the power relations in a situation of authoritarianism, dictatorship, was really what Sharp emphasized. But with this, came also um, a focus that excluded a number of other things like morality, ethics, aesthetics, culture, communication, religion as important factors in understanding conflicts and nonviolent ways of acting. So I think that at 73, Jean Sharp was part of a very important uh, new understanding of power. Together with people like Michel Foucault and Lukes and other people that have been in tremendously important in our understanding of what is power, Sharp also understood that power was built on some kind of social relationships, dependency of what the citizens actually were doing 
if they were cooperating or not, that there were social roots for power. And if you broke these social roots, you would also make seemingly um, powerful dictators appear with their weakness and lack of power. But that demanded a strategy of mass action. It demanded uh, a, an approach that took these potentials seriously within nonviolent action, right? So with this pluralist understanding of power, uh, Sharp was part of, I would say, an important social scientific um, approach at that time. He took inspiration from Hannah Arendt, for example, in his own thinking. Um, and with that, I think, I think that uh, nonviolent action studies were, you could say, in the forefront of social science together with other people. But it hasn't continued like that. The paradigm that was created has stifled, I would say, very much of the theoretical development. This has kind of stayed on the approach since then. Since this technique approach has been so dominating, uh, I would say that today, <clears throat> 40 years later, then, or what is it? Is it 50 years? 73? 40. 40 years, <laughs> thank you. Um, it is uh, instead a sign of weakness because within this period of the 70s and 80s, in social science, we have seen the cultural turn, for example. There has been a lot of new discourse-based theories. There has been a lot of other forms of approaches to uh, social science where the studies of nonviolent action has not been part of, of taking that in. So I would argue then that there is a need for a conceptual and theoretical development within our understanding of what is nonviolent action and civil resistance. We need to go beyond but build on the work that is done by Sharp and in, in the technique approach. That is because I think the approach is limited and reductionist. It reduces the nonviolent struggle to a struggle of, you could say, a chess game where you are uh, doing a power struggle according to a rational strategy of how you could then wage power in a different way. It, it only, you could say, it only uh, changes the type of weapon used in a nonviolent warfare with, with uh, 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 ordinary warfare. <laughs> Yet, even if it's limited and reductionist, I would say it's not useless. It's, it's, instead, it's very forceful and inspirational. Many people have been inspired by this take and this understanding of nonviolent action, probably because there is still this prejudice that nonviolent actions is, is some kind of a weak form of struggle, that it is some kind of a, something for, for softies. Um, but this approach has inspired activists. I could say, ironically, in, in a way, because Sharp was not really interested to talk to activists. When he did his work, he was interested to convince uh, policymakers, military officers, governments, about the idea of applying this on a large scale and train people within it, it what he called civil-based defense, which would be based then on, on civil resistance. But it has been activists that have been taking up this, reading his stuff, and have been applying it. As we have seen, for example, in the Arab Spring, where the writings of Jean Sharp has been widely spread. So I would say it's necessary to go beyond, yet build on the work that Sharp has done. My second point here, then, is a dilemma that we see within the revolution, or rather after revolutions in the sense that this, what I'm writing now here, is, uh, I think, rather well proven today, that nonviolent action is a more effective uh, tool in overthrowing regimes without eating its children. You know this saying from the French Revolution and other revolutions, that revolutions tend to eat up their own children. 
revolutions have been in the armed tradition, uh, been in such a way that it created a lot of new forms of authoritarian power, new forms of organized violence that have been uh, creating even worse dictatorships, even worse situations of genocides after the revolutions. So nonviolent action seems to be a much more effective weapon in overthrowing regimes without doing this. But it seems to be less able to achieve transformation than the violent revolutions that we have seen. And the evidence for this is uh, by, among other people, shown by uh, a study done by Erika Shenovet that will be the next speaker at, in this series here. We have a numerous examples of peaceful revolutions. It depends a bit on how you, how you define peaceful revolutions. I mean then revolutions done by peaceful oppositions, uh, basically not being armed in their strategy to overthrow a regime. Like we have seen in South Africa, for example, where the, uh, there was an armed struggle, but the, it was the non-armed struggle that actually were the key factor in break, bringing down the apartheid regime. As we have seen in the Philippines in 86 with the overthrow of Marcos, as we have seen in, in, in Tunisia and also in Egypt, at least in the first revolution in Egypt, or whatever uh, we will call that, um, we have seen it in the Eastern European countries, in East Germany, in Poland. Uh, we have seen it in Chile when Pinochet was forced to resign, and so on and so on. We have seen it in about 40 cases the last 30 years. It's an impressive, very impressive record of, of achievement for popular movements applying strikes, non-cooperation on a massive scale, and overthrowing dictatorships. And armed revolutions are not able to show anything similar to that. It's even hard to find the one and two examples the last 30 years that actually achieved even a regime change. But the problem here is that many of these cases show a problematic tendency of achieving very, very modest levels of freedom, equality, justice, and democracy afterwards. It's better in achieving that in, than in military uh, revolutions, but still it's depressing when you look at it a little bit more carefully. One example is that South Africa, that was plagued with a racist dictatorship during apartheid, with obvious incredible inequalities in that country uh, up to the, the first free election in 1994. But the depressing fact is that South Africa is today 20 years later, um, 10 years later, no, <laughs> sorry for my counting here, uh, 20 years later, um, South Africa is today uh, as unequal as it was during the, the racist dictatorship. So it's among the worst 10 countries in the world if you look on, on uh, uh, inequality index. That is surprising with the strong position of the ANC since the first election. But the same seems to be the case with many other uh, countries like Georgia and Ukraine, uh, where we saw peaceful regime changes. They have lower human development index today than during the so socialist dictatorship. So there seems to be a need for a new revolutionary strategy in order to somehow address this problem. And I would claim this, that nonviolent action strategies need to deal with how to create both regime change and social transformation. <coughs> so if we're interested in regime changes that contribute actually to democratization, some form of human development, some form of equality afterwards, there has to also be an interest within our theories and our understanding of what is civil resistance, if that is going to be possible. <coughs> Thirdly, and I will link these different criticism of other areas here, 
or challenges that exist in these areas when I come with my proposal. We have within conflict studies a special concept called protracted conflicts. And you can say that one way to, to understand that is that if you have relations of domination in terms of what we also could call oppression, combined with organized violence, I mean when violence is normalized, collective, and institutionalized in society, we could call that militarism also. That is combined with emotional distances and hate among different groups, where there is a creation of enemy images, unwillingness to sympathize, and so on. And you combine that as well with a lack of mutual understanding and shared knowledge between these groups. Then you could say that you have a protracted violent conflict. And I think that that might be the greatest kind of challenge that we could think of uh, if we are serious about that nonviolent action and civil resistance is an alternative, uh, then it is not just a matter of overthrowing a regime. <coughs> in, in a situation like this, you have much more challenges than that because the kind of violence that we're talking about is so ingrained within society, it exists in so many different ways, also emotional, cultural ways, that a, a massive non-cooperation campaign is not really a, able to deal with that, if you see what I mean. And if we're going to, sp if, if we're going to speak to the established conflict studies area with, with our studies of civil resistance, we need to talk about also how is nonviolent action able to address such a thing as protracted violent conflict. One possible answer to this is this, and that would be my claim that researchers that are studying <coughs> civil resistance, they discuss and movements they use only a small fraction of the potential social change force of nonviolent action. We have seen something that is really very powerful. It's, it's obviously able to overthrow dictatorships when organized in a, in, a, in, a, in a popular way, when there are people that are having a strategy of how to address that kind of, of power. But I would, I would claim it's even more powerful than that. It, it could achieve more. And then we need to see what nonviolent action is about in a different way. That's what I call the four dimensions of nonviolent action. And basically, my claim is that Gene Sharp is, and the te technique approach, they're only studying one of them. The whole thing here is then based on my application of social science theories uh, from Habermas, Foucault, Bourdieu, and Goffman, and I have applied that to nonviolent action and seen what, what kind of different nonviolent action do we get. If we see with the eyeglasses of Goffman what happens with nonviolent action then. If we use the perspective of Foucault on power, what happens with the understanding that, that the, the consent theory that Sharp calls it, it becomes a different take on what actually nonviolent action is doing. Here, because there is limited time, I will focus on what then uh, help, what, what Habermas can help us with in understanding uh, how nonviolent action is, is something more than just a technique approach. Habermas is, is known for, for a lot of different uh, theories, but he has one theory which is dealing with the types of social action, where he's talking about the different forms of ways of acting, the different rationalities that exist within uh, social action. And that happens to be four, ty four uh, uh, types of, 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 um, of social action. The first one is the goal-oriented rationality. It addresses with 
you could say, its aims and its activities, the question around, is it effective? Here, it is a matter of using instrumental techniques on objects, like we do in, in our industrial production, in our dealing with, with, the, with the nature uh, and, and material objects. But it's also what we use when we are applying strategy towards other humans in a political, economic, strategic struggle. <coughs> So when we take into account what other people are going to do and we are acting on, you could say, a market, then we are dealing with each other in a strategic field. The point here is that Habermas claims that this has been the type of rationality, the type of social action that has dominated the modern society. It's been what had been uh, favored in the state, in the bureaucracies and the corporations, and also among the established uh, civil society organizations that applied the bureaucratic uh, form of organizing. Um, in such a strong way that many have, re have seen it as this is the only way that we do uh, social actions. <laughs> And Habermas' work has been to highlight that that is only one of different ways that we act uh, um, and that it applies rationality in a special way. And some of the problematic aspects that we see within the modern society is connected to this overemphasis on the goal-oriented rationality. The second form of rationality that Habermas is, is, is um, uh, highlighting is what he calls normative rationality. It addresses totally different things of our social world. It addresses the question of what is right and wrong. And here he doesn't do it in the way that he applies or, or thinks in terms of that there exists some kind of right and wrong outside of us. He looks on it, how we're dealing with it uh, socially together with each other. And his claim is very simple, and it's basic sociology, you could say. Uh, it's, it's based on the idea that every community of people apply norms. They have certain rules of how you can behave. In an academic group, or even in a fascist group, there will be norms of how it is okay to talk, dress, act, and be together. These are detailed. They are about how we can, can um, say hello to each other, how we eat, and how we, how we are socializing together, right? So it's the unwritten laws of any social group. The thing here is the rationality within the normative uh, action, the normative way of being together is not addressing goal-oriented rationality. It's not about efficiency. It's about do you apply to the norms, do you follow them or not? And how is your understanding of how it, we should be together? So when you question a norm in a community, you don't say uh, about if it's effective or not. You're, you're saying, well, is this right or not? Should we not have it in a different way? Shouldn't that change because you have some arguments about some other norm that you think is more fundamental? And you, you would perhaps argue that this norm is in a conflict with another con uh, other norm. So you would argue within the world of norms. So you would be rational in a different way. You, you would be understood as irrational if you would not speak the language of the norms within that social group. So that is a, a different way of acting. And the third way of acting is then what, what Habermas alternates between calling drama dramaturgical rationality and sometimes self-expressive rationality. The dramaturgical or self-expressive rationality addresses a third set of questions. It is about the aesthetics of our lives. What is beautiful, what is valuable, what is truthful? Here, 
we're not speaking about the norms in the group. We're not speaking about what is goal-oriented effectiveness. We're speaking about instead about what is my experience of what is beautiful or what tastes good or what, what kind of things that is truthful about who I am. You cannot come to me and say, no, you are wrong because this is not effective. Or you, you cannot say that that is wrong to feel like that because there's a norm saying that we shouldn't, we shouldn't do it like that. I have the feeling or I don't have the feeling. I'm honest about having the feeling or not. So you could question me by saying, how do you mean? Could you explain more? so that I can understand what you mean. You could also question me by saying, but, but yesterday you said something else about how you felt about that. And then you could, you could question. But then you are questioning me within my subjective life world of how I am experiencing things. You with me? We all have been in these kind of discussions when we have seen a film or when we, we see a painting, we are arguing about if it's beautiful or not. But basically, that is addressing something of a self-expressive rationality that could not be applied according to normative or goal-oriented rationality. Fourthly, there is this what Habermas is mostly known for, and that is the last rationality that he highlights. That's a communicative rationality, which he argues is addressing the question of what is truth and false. And we as scientists might say that, well, that is shown in a test. We do a test and then we show with the evidence if it's true or not. Well, yes, but we also argue about these kind of tests, don't we? Within the scientific community, even when we do empirical tests, there will be a discussion. So. I would argue that whatever we are dealing with, we are dealing with a world that is always interpreted. We are always dealing with something that it, it's possible to understand the facts in a different way. So the only guiding principle we have, if we are not saying that there exists something outside of us that could decide what is truth or false, but if it's up to us, then it is a matter of communicative rationality. We have to argue about it. And through that argument, there we develop more or less convincing reasons for why we think this or that. And that will change with time. It will change with the discussion. But the force of the rationality here is about convincing arguments where we talk together and reach something of a mutual understanding or perhaps in the strong sense, sometimes even an agreement. Here, there is this thinking of Habermas that there exists a situation where you have an ideal speech situation, where there is no influence by power, uh, violence, or exclusion but where everyone is having the possibility to take part in the discussion and freely exchange arguments. We know from reality that that is not really happening. It doesn't even happen at the university. It doesn't even happen in our family and, or among our friends. There, are, there is always a matter of status differences. There is always a matter of, of misunderstandings and so on, right? But this thought about ideal speech is I think very interesting as an utopian concept that helps us to guide towards how could we increase the space for communicative rationality if we would diminish the influence of domination in our relationships then we would free up space for having more of communicative rationality that could that could play out that happens to be one of the meeting points where Gandhi and Habermas are speaking the same language, uh, which, by, by the way, is one of my, my arguments in the book that is, that is coming out next year, that Gandhi and Habermas are, are uh, complementing each other because Gandhi is giving the, the methods, the, the, the way of struggling that could 
make ideal speech more possible, at least to move towards uh, a, a greater uh, approximate a proximal uh, situation with, with, with ideal speech by diminishing the influence of, of domination. Okay, so then, as you have guessed now, I will apply these four social forms of action on nonviolent action. And I will say the first one is what Gene Sharp has been talking about all the time, and that has been inspiring social scientists and I want to underline activists in actually carrying out so much of, of activism in the world that has created democracies, at least of some limited um, degree. And that is the power breaking or the goal oriented rationality within nonviolent action, where we use non cooperation interventions or blockades or similar kinds of actions that actually break. Uh, domination relations, and by that actually is fighting, you could say, a nonviolent uh, po <clears throat> power struggle. So I don't have to say too much about that since that's where we find the writings within civil resistance today. But the, the three other areas, we have much more limited research being done. And my proposal is then, of course, if, if, if this kind of, of, of framework would be interesting for other researchers, it would be something where we could carry out a lot of empirical research. So secondly, we would have the normative regulation that happens within nonviolent action, guided by the normative rationality. Here we would have instead a focus of something that Gene Sharp uh, put aside and never really made much out of, but was emphasized very strongly by Gandhi. Gandhi was even saying that this part is much more important than the, the nonviolent resistance part. He was saying that the constructive work, the alternative institution building, was the most powerful part within nonviolent action. And he was very depressed in the end of his life because he, he couldn't see that he could convince the other activists within the Indian liberation movement that, to take up that. <coughs> They understood the part with civil disobedience, boycotts and strikes and all that, but they didn't really find it so interesting with building up alternative institutions. Here, you would create alternative institutions already during the struggle. As Gandhi said, you would not build the new society out of the ashes of the old, but you are creating the small embryos, the small seeds that could then become the uh, new society after any kind of regime change. You would create other kinds of schools, other kinds of ways of having corporations, other ways of, of having a media, other ways of, of having your politics. You would create that already during the struggle. And by doing that, you're also building up resources that makes it possible to create a struggle in, in a stronger sense. But I think it's also, importantly, a, a way of experimenting with how we could live differently, more nonviolently together. Because we have to understand that in order to create something where people actually behave differently, we need the institutional backing of other forms of, of social institutions. I think that's also kind of basic sociology. Thirdly, which is the most, I would say, uh, under-researched area, which I find really interesting uh, and hope to carry out research on uh, in future. It's what I call utopian enactment. Here, nonviolent action is applying the dramaturgical rationality. Here, activists are, because activists are doing this already, even though we as social scientists have not, have not find, found it out yet. Here they act as if the ideals are already reached. Some people in the literature call this goal revealing action. You act in such a way that you show visibly in your way of acting what kind of goals you are striving towards. So in that sense, you make it visible for other people, people that are not yet supporters of that struggle maybe, that could see what kind of, of vis visions are, are being created in that movement. I'll, I'll give examples on all these four. I'm just explaining them now. 
So I'll come to examples here that maybe make the number three uh, more possible to understand. Number four is then dialogue facilitation or the communicative rationality within the nonviolent action struggle. Here, the emphasis would be on promoting and creating the possibilities for negotiations and also democratic organizing within that oppositional movement, developing forms of communication and also doing basic fact-finding. I don't know if you're aware of it, but Gandhi emphasized the importance of a movement not just talking about what kind of demands they have, but actually to do their own investigations. What were actually the conditions for the people that were oppressed? <clears throat> so this is basically my, my way of giving new names to what is going on with nonviolent action. Power breaking, normative regulation, utopian enactment, and dialogue facilitation. To give you then examples on this, because it's already going on, I would claim, among the activists. <clears throat> it's easy with number one, because then we have all the regime changes that we have seen. Uh, as I mentioned, South Africa is one ex such an example. And many people have been writing about these astonishing regime changes happening. On the normative regulation, we can see things happening like for example, among the impressive landless movement in Brazil, MST. I've been writing uh, articles about that. If people are interested to know more, uh, you, uh, I could share with you. They have been struggling since the early 80s against a country which is having one of the worst distributions of land in the world, Brazil. People of millions are starving, yet there exists a lot of land. You know, Brazil is big as whole Europe, uh, and, and there is a lot of land for people. So these people in the landless movement, they have occupied land, and they have done it peacefully. And they often live in plastic tents for, for five years, ten years, uh, even longer, before they, with the combi com combination of legal struggle and, and, and um, uh, uh, marches and lobby uh, work and so on, they gain the right to have the land. But the inter interesting thing is that when you interview these people, the first thing they do when they occupy the land, and remember, I mean, they, they are just there with plastic tents and, and all that. They are very proud in saying that the first thing they create is a school for their kids. They will be thrown out by armed militias. They will be arrested by the police, but then they come back and they build up the school again. And the thing is that they try to create a different school, not the same kind of school that you have in Brazil. They are inspired by Paulo Freire pedagogics, for those of you who have heard about that. Uh, <clears throat> so in mathematics classes, they are counting on, on, for example, the distribution of land in the area and so on. Um, but not only that, um, they create also their own cooperative farming. Uh, and when they get access to the, uh, to the land, uh, they create their own uh, smaller types of, of factories. They have uh, supermarkets today. They have even one university. Uh, today it's about 1.5 million people that are active in, in the uh, landless movement. And if you take them together, if you take all these land occupations together since the early 80s, and you look on the land that they have liberated, in this way, it's land distribution from below. If you put all these land together, the, the area is big as the whole Cuba. So I would claim that you're having a Cuban revolution again happening in, in Latin America, but this time it's peaceful, and this time it's happened from below, and it's not addressing the government in Brazil, it's, it's happening on, on the local level. But they are then creating their own kind of institutions. They're creating their own leadership. There are articles out there looking on the astonishing thing that at the MST, they are creating their own leadership. You know, it's a common problem that very often educated middle class from the urban areas, they become the leaders of a movement. But in MST, they, with this emphasis on schooling, their own schooling, they educate their own leaders and representatives. So. They are trying to build up their own kinds of normative structure within, within the movement. 
And I won't have time to go through all the other examples, but we have within the civil rights movement similar things with the Freedom Summers and so on. The Muslim uh, activists within the Kudai Kidmagar, uh, the constructive program in India and the black consciousness movement that happened in South Africa and so on. We have this kind of the building of new alternative structures that I think are so essential in, in, in these normative regulations. Thirdly, then, about utopian enactment, which might be one of the forms of nonviolent action that might be more difficult to understand immediately. I'll give you the, the image of the sit-ins that are so famous in this country. Uh, Martin Luther King was, was talking about the sit-ins at the segregated cafes and, and lunch counters and so on as being a way of dramat dramatizing injustice. And I think he was very right in that. It was a way of dramatizing injustice because when black and white people went together to these encounters, sat down, calmly asked to be served, and they were not able to be served because it was only reserved for only white people. Then they got beaten, they got arrested, they were put in jail, and in that sense you dramatize the injustice. But I would say that it was also a way to dramatize the justice. It was also a way to dramatize the possibility of black and white people living together. Because there were black and white people going into the, the restaurants, to the lunch counters together. They were joined together in taking that risk. They were acting together, and by that, in a small sense, showing the, the possibility of the utopia, namely that we could live together in a peaceful and respectful way. And that was even shown stronger in something which is, I think, quite unknown here in the country still, the beachings. You probably haven't heard too, too much about that. The beachings were against, of course, then segregated beaches. The interesting thing is, here was that beaches we are connecting with, you know, family, relaxing, free time, having a good uh, time at the beach. So when there were groups of black and white people going together to white-only beaches, that, of course, created also the same kind of situation as with the lounge counters. But the thing is, they were coming there with their picnic basket. They were coming there with their, their um, bathing suits and so on, on the way for just having good time on the beach. Then they got arrested. They were brought to jail. And when they were taken out, they took their picnic basket, they took their bathing suits, and they went to the beach again. And then they got arrested and got beaten even harder, uh, and then they were brought to jail. And then they went back with their picnic basket, and they were ha happy and wanted to have a, a swim at, at the beach. So I think here, by the way of not acting with violence, by the way that acting as if it was possible to take a swim on a sunny day, even though you still have been mistreated, you have, you're taking clearly risks, maybe even for your life, but you go there and the approach is picnic basket. You're not going there with sticks to fight your way to the beach. You're going there with a picnic basket. You're showing, I think, the possibility and the belief in, in that we could live together and share the beach. So what is dramatized here is both the justice, the possibility of integration, living together, and the injustices and the brutality of the segregation. And the same has been shown in many uh, actions that I've taken part in in, in Germany, or at this, as it was called at that time, West Germany during the Cold War. Um, in Mutlang, and there was an American nuclear uh, weapon base with Pershing II missiles. And there was a strong campaign of, of people from, from the area and around in West Germany that were making blockades against the, this uh, nuclear weapon base. But the fascinating thing with these blockades, I think, was that, that they were not just sitting down there. You know, people like me with beards and, and sitting there being angry and holding arms and saying we don't move away from here. But instead, they were trying to show that the whole society was against these nuclear weapons. 
And how do you do that? Well, you only do that by actually bringing the whole society to do it. So what they did was that school teachers, they were bringing their, together their, their, their students and they were having lectures on the street at the same time as they blockaded. Nurses were coming dressed in their clothes from the hospital and they were standing in front of the gates blockading it. There were people that had survived from the concentration camps in, in, in the Second World War, dressed in their, 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 uh, their concentration camps uniforms, sitting there and blockading what they called were uh, flying uh, extermination ovens. They, that's what they called the nuclear weapons. They saw the link between the extermination of the Jews during the Second World War and the use of nuclear weapons. So they felt that they had to sit there and they were sitting there as then former concentration camp uh, prisoners. And then my favorite, there was a symphony orchestra that played uh, classical music and at the same time they were blockading the base. And for some reason then the police decided that, well, Let's just take a day off and let them play. Uh, they, they probably felt really uneasy uh, arresting them. Um, but then when they continued the second day, um, the police got really uh, tired of them and they got arrested. And in this way, people were coming from many different social groups and they were displaying, I think, in a very lively way that the society as such they are against this. So you are, in a way, showing, I would say, uh, the possibility, the, the, um, the, um, the strength of a civil society united in, in this kind of enactment. Lastly, then, uh, the dialogue facilitation strength or uh, part of the nonviolent action in South Africa, in Poland, and East Germany, we have seen so much of the emphasis on going into negotiations with your uh, opponents, your enemies, uh, on the other side of the regime. In South Africa, there were a long period of informal talks between Mandela and, and the, the politicians in the apartheid government before they entered into formal negotiations. And that approach to nonviolent resistance, I think, is, in my understanding, a major reason why South Africa is a consolidated liberal democracy today. There are, there are problems in South Africa, but the democracy became stable very quick. And I would say that is because these, the approach by Mandela and, and the ANC were that they wanted to find negotiated agreement with their enemies that have been so much using torture, uh, mass killings, and all kinds of violations against them. Still, they wanted to, to find an agreement. To the point even that after uh, ANC won an overwhelming victory in 1994 and got, I think it was 65% of the votes or even 70% of the votes, they had the right to actually change the constitution themselves. In that situation, ANC decided that they would invite their former enemies from the apartheid government, even, even Butelesi from, from the Inkata party that had been cooperating with the uh, apartheid regime and killing ANC supporters. They were invited to rule together in a joint government. And that made it very clear that the ANC were interested in integration and having, as they call, a rainbow nation to having one where everyone had the right to be. There, there was a stable support for democracy. When I was there in 94, just after the election, I can promise you, people were preparing for a civil war. They were convinced. People were buying things in order to bunker up food and all that because they were prepared that it's going to be a civil war. So in that situation, they decided to rule together. And I think that is an understanding that the struggle is not only about humiliating and, and, and overthrowing and destroying the regime that you fight against. It's also about how do you live together afterwards. And then you have to 
you have to at least with most people in society engage with dialogue and understanding that that is the only possibility of course i'm not saying that criminals should not be prosecuted afterwards in tribunals and all that i'm just saying that with the most of the people in the country you have to engage with some form of understanding and i think that was also the approach in poland with the negotiations happening there and in east germany as an, and as, as a matter of fact that is my understanding also of trade union strategy um, that we have seen so much of, as, especially in Western Europe, where the idea is not only that you organize and make strikes, but you engage with negotiations as soon as possible with the employers in order to find agreements. And that is, I would say, the reason why we have had so much of, of improvement of the, the rules and uh, regulations when it comes to worker safety and, and, uh, and um, possibility of, of vacation and, and social security and all that happening in Western Germany. Because there has been both the emphasis of organizing in trade unions and having the, the, um, the focus on, on finding negotiated agreements. And within movements today, if you look at them, they, they are developing what they are calling consensus decision making. So they are trying to find ways of making decisions within many of these movements that are, I would say, more ambitious when it comes to democracy than what we have with the, the normal kind of voting with majorities and so on. And I'm not saying that that kind of experiment happening in the movements are the answer for the whole society, but it's interesting how these movements are trying to experiment with democracy. So it, it shows an interest in how do you develop demo democratic forms within the movement. And, and I think in many of the movements today, there is an understanding that if you don't develop democracy within these movements, you will have really big problems to create more democracy when you have won the struggle and created some kind of regime change. <clears throat> so these are just then examples. And I will finish here by just suggesting three possible questions. But I'm open to uh, all kinds of questions from you. Um, firstly, I'm, I'm interested to hear if, if you think this theoretical uh, framework is, is coherent and, and understandable. Secondly, if it's possible, you think, to implement uh, within movement practice. And thirdly, I'm interested in what you think about my research strategy. I mean, it's quite simple, actually. The idea is you take some of the established social theories that exist in other fields and you apply it on nonviolent action. And by that, you see nonviolent action in a new way. My point is not that Habermas is right. My point is not that my framework is right. My point is that this is a fruitful way to make research, I think. It's a fruitful way to actually quickly get a new understanding and expand our knowledge about nonviolent action. And if we stay limited to a technique approach, seeing nonviolent action only as a power struggle, we will not be able to see these kind of things, and we will not be able to contribute in, in the understanding of civil resistance. Thank you very much. Thank you.